in this video, I go in depth with High Brazil. We chat production, we talk about creating an album and his elevator program. Let's jump in. Hey, it's Graham Farmer from Data Transmission. And recently on Twitch, and I'm a Twitch partner now. Did you see? Did you see the video? Check out the video in the card. I'll link to it. I stream Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays on Twitch. And we have interviews, we have demo listening sessions, we have Q and A's, we have social media tips. We do it all over on Twitch. So come and give us a follow, links below. Join our Discord. And there's loads of producers all helping each other, networking. It's a really good community joining in Discord. So again, the link's below. Come and join us on Discord as well. Recently on Twitch, I was joined by the techno producer, High Brazil. He's such a font of knowledge. It was great a chat. It was really in depth. He's created his own program to help producers get further and help techno producers get further. So we talk about that. We talk about creating albums and the kind of thought process and stuff that he goes beyond into creating albums. He gives loads of production tips. Without further ado, let's jump into it. Hello, mate. Hey, mate. How you doing? How was your weekend, dude? Yeah, uh, weekend was good. Pretty chilled. Working pretty flat out the last 15 months. So, uh, yeah, we uh, t went to, a, on a weekend, staycation thing. Went to a hotel, no social media, no emails and stuff. Took it easy. And, yeah, it was nice. So, for the people that don't know who you are, can we just kind of, let's go into you first, and then we can talk about Elevator afterwards. So, if, yeah, just give us the 411, how, your origin story. Yeah, well, like... Uh, like a lot of people uh, my age in Dublin, I kind of started off just buying records, got to record shops and that. There's a club called the Red Box, which was like a community centre. You know, you could go there on your own. You'd find, you know, people you knew, you know. Um, it's just a place everyone went. So that's where I cut my teeth, really. You know, first time I saw Dave Clark, Jeff Mills, you know, Surgeon, all that, all that kind of stuff, you know, all that good stuff. So... That's really, really what kind of got me into things. And I used to love going to record shops. I used to absolutely love digging for records. That was one of my favorite things to do and just playing turntables and things. And as the noddies and stuff tipped on, I was kind of got more into production. I kind of, you know, DJ went totally digital and stuff, which is fine, you know, if, if, um, but it kind of, I moved more towards studio. So I started studying uh, sound music tech. I started working as a sound engineer, Temple Lane, Greslot Studios. That period of four years was just an incredible learning experience, you know, because as producing, engineering, recording, folk, blues, uh, some jazz, world music, a lot of prog rock, kind of what was happening in Dublin at the time. So, yeah, that was pretty. That was pretty interesting, and working with so many talented artists, some of them I'm still friends with today. You know, because when you record an album with someone, it's kind of like, you know, you have a shared experience, or you've been on a holiday with someone, mm. you know that person better. You know, so I used to love that, but then kind of like a lot of for a lot of recording studios, work kind of dried up and stuff. So I kind of went on my own, my own way, and was doing like kind of mentorship and and coaching and stuff like that with people. I was running parties. I did an orchestra show for Jeff Mills in um, in Dublin, the the first known one, and you know things like that. And obviously, I was working in radio and stuff as well. And after this experience and stuff, I wanted to you know I took a step back, focus more on the creative side, and that's kind of where the Hobbies Project projects started. So I was working on that for nearly a year. Launched it in twenty sixteen. Uh, as a live project, 100% live project, you know, mm -hmm. and yeah, just kind of built built it out from there. Launched the Hybrid Music label, which is a vinyl and digital record label, more digital at the moment, but we do maybe one vinyl a year, mm -hmm. and uh, that's just for Hybrid releases. The whole thing's been kind of a journey and a process, like learning both myself and then also going to other producers and stuff and learning from them like i went to dave robertson in um, portsmouth for a while he was like hugely influential for me a reset robot and that was like real hardcore high-end techno production masterclass mm. anytime i went to his studio so i'd go to his studio maybe maybe two three times four times a year for a few days did that until i felt like i really had something you know and dave was a great mentor and stuff and for a while you kind of find your own path you know so i kind of applied all these kind of lessons i learned from dave also back in 2010 i spent a year doing the same thing with matador going to his studio so i took the 
technical and creative side very seriously and and you know learning everything i actually could um so i've pumped all this into high brazil and i've pumped all that into obviously the training and learning programs i've developed for music producers you know so yeah we launched the high brazil project launched the high brazil label moved to berlin in 2018 shortly after that i got signed to records yeah, I did my first release with them in 2019, I think. But it, it, in the around the same time, I kind of start work with Matt as a studio tech. Uh, he was doing the Serve project with Patrick Mason. Uh, they were doing live shows. They were going from like a DJ plus vocalist to being a full live show. And and uh, mm-hmm. obviously, I was you know I had some experience doing live, so I was asked to help out just on the technical back end kind of bit. So that was kind of all, all around the same time. That, that was a very exciting time, actually, because their first live show was in Panorama Bar. And I remember just like really sit, it was my first time in the booth in Panorama Bar, obviously. So I remember just sitting, standing there and all this stuff was going on. It was a one hour, very intense live show. Incredible experience. But I spent like the rest of the evening and I wasn't drinking at the time or anything. I got through these like periods where I just don't drink. I just focus on music or writing or or whatever like that um i do like maybe three to six months a year um i did three this year for example it's great you get a lot done you know you get a lot done i've been doing exactly i've been doing exactly that from like set i did september to december and then i did december to march and then i've done march to june and then now i'll probably do june yeah. till october again you know yeah it's just i think like yourself you're spinning a lot of plates a lot of different projects you know you really can't afford a day or two even if you have like three four beers you feel it the next day when i was younger mm-hmm. i don't think i really acknowledged that i was like oh i'm fine i feel fine but no I, th- I think it's just definitely in terms of productivity and stuff it's it's a lot more helpful so yes yeah, I, sp- I spent like the weekend and any time i could get guestless basically going into panorama bar and listening to music and stuff and Burgoyne obviously as well and uh, really just listening to how records sounded in that space kick mm. drums bass lines hi-hats that kind of stuff and uh, obviously you don't need a lot of elements to sound good on those systems they just need to sound well as in the elements mm. themselves need to sound well so i spent like a few months obviously working with as a studio on live tech and also earned some mixed credits for other artists on records as well yeah in that time i wrote my album embers and matt signed it he's like look let's put this out as an album double vinyl that went quite well i did my first show on panorama bar then because i'd written this album for panorama bar in my head so mm. I'd, I'd visualize the space write the song in my head so everything from reverbs delays everything was tuned to that space but you had to visualize the space playing there playing those records there like a year nine months later after writing them was like a very a full circle experience you know and um that was my last show that was actually my last show before things got shut down uh, i think burgoyne is closed within two three weeks due to the pandemic but yeah. i think like moving to berlin and and working with matt w- with records and being around other records artists like um, P. Leone and uh, Spencer Parker and stuff and just like talking music all the time and stuff it and and also going to hard wax so I have a record shop again I go you know I go there well up to the up to the pandemic I tried to go there nearly every week or every second week but uh, yeah going there in Schneider's Lad and the mod it's a modular synth shop in Berlin they used to do these Thursday workshops and tech walkthroughs and new modules and have like pr- producers or you know have um tech companies come in and explain their latest module and stuff i used to eat that up that was all part of <laughs> what fed into my album you know embers that was my debut album as well so all the all these like influences fed in and just just the album just happened you know really mm. really came together yeah over the last few months i was speaking with uh, christopher Coe, who runs awesome sound live with Kirk cox and i was funnily enough i was watching ad live this year you were there as well obviously and I was watching Carl and Chris talk about their life setup, the studio setup, and you know what they're doing, and you know the modules they're into, and all this kind of stuff. And I was looking at it going, oh, this is fantastic! You know, really, it's really great to see Carl talking about tech, and uh, really, really enjoyed the seminar. But and so try to stay off Instagram, but I went onto Instagram to um, message Chris and say, hey, you know, just would you be interested in hearing some music? And I actually had a message from him going, hey man, would you be interested in sending some music over for us to check? it was just a serendipitous thing so we uh we had a couple of chats uh did a few zoom calls and stuff so that's where the first awesome sound wave release uh came together and that was released this year 
in March. That was Desic EP. So that's kind of like my, my main two label projects at the moment. I'm working with obviously Records and Awesome Soundwave. And I've been speaking with Marco Ferrioni for like the last year. We've been sending music over back. So we finally settled on some tracks for his label as well. Uh, so Marco's been great. He's, you know, he had a very certain vision of what he wanted. So you know getting the right things there and he's doing a remix and stuff so we just signed off on that over the weekend actually so we should see that coming out on his label uncage um later in the year that's cool so that's kind of that yeah that takes me up to date with with the with the high brazil stuff you know in a nutshell that's that's the lot, you know? <laughs> that's cool well yeah. so were you releasing before was you releasing as yourself before high present well had that obviously that project started you're saying 2016 2017 I was doing some, like, what I'd do is I'd send music, I'd write music and send it to, like, Dave Clark, and he'd play it. I, did, I wasn't really sure where to send it, where to go. I was writing music, I was putting on, let's say, I was promoting shows in Dublin. Uh, I did a show called, a series of events called Apocalypse Now. Um, so we had, like, Jeff Mills, Anna Fitzpatrick, this is back in 2012, Anna Fitzpatrick, nice. uh, The Advent, Carrie Leckerbush, uh, Matador. Or those, that was actually when I started playing live. And uh, let's say venue manager asked asked if I could play live instead of DJ, um, because you know it's like I think at the time he was like, "Look, we actually if you could play live, that'd be great, because that we have to pay less fat on our ticket sales." And I'm like, "Yeah, cool, no problem." So that kind of <laughs> kicked me into it, you know. That's so I was like, "Right, oh, it's, just, it's live," you know. So I was really really tr thrown into it and uh, I started writing music for those shows. So I wrote, wrote a lot of music but I released with the Advents Combination Research and stuff mm -hmm. like that um, uh, released Sleaze, uh, Sleaze Records. You had to take a massive step back, start over, start fresh and the High Brazil project has a very specific sound. I wanted it to be stripped back, I wanted it to be like really focused on the core elements for me which are kick, bass, hi-hat, maybe a ride cymbal, synth. You know, so it's really centered around the core elements, maybe a vocal here and there, but mm. really build around that, fatten them up as much as possible and keep it really stripped, you know. So, yeah, so really, the, I, I guess the High Brazil project is really where I found direction. But I think when I moved to Berlin and is around all these different in, influences and also like people in Berlin have been very, very kind to me as well. They've been very supportive. I've shown me a lot of faith, especially through everyone in records have shown a lot of faith in what I'm doing. So they don't really go, oh, do this or do that. They just go, I like that, I like that, and I like that. And, okay, cool, well, let's do an EP or let's do an album. Or That really was, was what changed everything. And I think kind of the, let's say, evolution in terms of like sound and, and development kind of accelerated hugely, especially from 2018 to like 20, 2020. That's mental. I, I like the fact that you're like literally in there with a few labels and it's just like building into those labels. I love that. And I love that they're being really supportive. So yeah, I, th I think like um, when I was working away on my, let's say, let's say pre high Brazil, I kind of, I always wanted to work with, I, th I think it's, it'd be one of my producer tips. Um, but like, I think it's really good to work, either build a community, build a label with a group of artists that you're friends with and you guys or you know everyone on the label creates a sound you know mm. or an aesthetic i think that's where great labels like i love what fuse london do that's like mates and relatives and it's a very t tightly knit group you know um and i think that's a great example you know building a kind of producer community and stuff but that's something i, d I was definitely in interested in i've been a records fan forever been hugely influenced by Carl Cox as well. Learning with three deck mixing his stuff. You know, Carl used to smash three turntables, and he used to be incredible. Watched him do it. You know, um, as did Jeff and, and Dave. So you know, working with Carl and Chris on Awesome Soundwave as well. It's it's brilliant because they're being very like, okay, we'll do an EP, but we want an album from you. So if I send them a few tracks, it's like we just work on the album. That's it. Just work on the album. Work on the album, and uh, they're giving me a lot of freedom to do it. So um, in the last last few months i've been recording a lot of like since you see in the background here a live album and i've been kind of mixing that and editing and mainly mixing and and i'm actually putting the final touches on the mastering today so yeah i think i, I think that one's nearly done you know but i have to do the listening test and check it in mate's house and check it on <laughs> you know different types of speakers and you know go in the uh, car have to do it. yeah yeah well i don't have a car here <laughs> so um 
but yeah, in, if I was if I was in Ireland, I, I'd be in a car somewhere, <laughs> definitely just driving for the sake of it. You know, I love that album, the album concept. Uh, so many more albums come out of last year as well. Like so many more people have sat down and gone, right, I've got all this time, I'm going to make an album. Where did you start, and what was that thought process that started with the album? Well, th- yeah, it's the million dollar question, really. Like, where do you start, and where do you finish, and when do you know you're done? Let's walk through the albums. So my first album was Embers. All these things happened at the same time. I had my first records release. I was spending a lot of time in the studio with Matt, Radio Slave, and also uh, helping out with the tech live setup for Served and stuff. And I was going to Hard Wax all the time. I was going to Schneider's Laden all the time. And uh, any chance I could, I'd go to Panorama Bar and just, or, or Burgoyne and just listen, 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 listen. So all these things fed into Embers. Embers felt complete. Embers just like happened, you know, um, mm. the sound and everything. The, the first week I worked with, with Served, how I balanced all my tracks changed overnight, you know, and that was just from listening to their music and, and being in, in Panorama Bar and how they were playing and stuff like that. And how, obviously how Matt, you know, plays records and stuff. Like hi-hats are really prominent and everything like that. So that was hugely influential. So all these things influenced me and these tracks came out and I would be sending them to Matt and he was playing them out and he was like, right, we've got an album, I think, here. And I was like, I wasn't thinking of it that way. Then I thought, oh yeah, cool. And as soon as he said that, I actually went in and wrote a lot more stuff and really tightened up the concept in terms sonically. So my first the debut album, Members, was very much of that creative space. So my next album, 10, which was 10 tracks I wanted to release on my, as the 10th release on my Hybrazil label. What I wanted to do with that was pick 10 records that I'd written basically over the course of 2020, from the time I finished Embers to the end of uh, 2020. So any tracks I'd written in that time period. And to be honest, most of it was in the earlier part of it, of that later in the year, I kind of changed a lot of things, I kind of, you know, I got certain results and I changed, let's say, how we use equipment and stuff. So that takes you back a step or two. So you kind of don't finish it. I don't, for me, anyway, I don't finish as much music. When I do those shifts, I have to do those shifts to change the sound or go find some new idea, you know? So what I did when I finished Embers, I did that. I, I changed how I worked completely from sound sources to to everything, different kicks, different things. And, and that's where the We Don't Flip EP came came from for that was released in records july 2020 and that's where most of the tracks came from from my next album which was 10 released on the hybrids label in january so that very much was like a snapshot of like that time period a crazy mm-hmm. time period obviously but it was a snapshot of that workflow and kind of you can i could hear myself pushing in different directions from where i was in 2019 and then with this one so this tr- this album I'm going to call Enter the Droid. It's set in the year 2051. So basically I'm going to be setting it in the future where I've managed to upload my a consciousness to a machine. And it's my first conversation with that machine or listening to this album. By then they think you'll be able to upload your consciousness to a robot or to a, maybe a cloud. I don't know. That just popped into my head as I was recording. But, but as I started this project, I was like, right, let's just change the BPMs from how we will be working the last year or so so I've went back into the 20, 120s again so in around 125 126 128 and just like fired media to machines hit record and just recording layers recording elements and stuff like that very much just putting in some drum loops that have maybe pre-made like a di- you know that I've done for my HBL sample packs putting in some 99 loops that I've engineered and just get the rhythm section down really quickly fire some MIDI out to some machines hit record and do the drums in the machines live, you know, just mm-hmm. on your own. So it's a weird thing. You're trying to do like a structure of the track, you know, on a controller. I can show you actually one of the controllers quickly. Um, that's it. There's nice. like an APC. It's actually, it's actually one of Matt's. I'm sharing the studio with Matt. Um, so Matt has like three MP- APC 40s. So I just boom, jump in. I can write the rhythm section pretty quick. And then record the synths and then do layers over the top. I just kept right recording, 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 recording. And then I kind of had a stop but a stop moment and kind of reviewed back over the tracks. And I was like, does this sound coherent? Does it sound like an album? Does it sound like a period in time? Does it sound like it's, uh, you know, I could say to myself, oh, yeah, I remember that time well. You know, this is going on and stuff. And it has to tell a story. It has to make sense as a, as a batch of tracks. So two tracks are merged into one. It's like this ambient drony thing. And the other ones just, for the most part, as they were recorded, 
minus a few edits here and there and stuff so i think really it's it's about mindset if you if you set it to do an album uh, i think it's important to break away from your mindset when you're doing an ep and i think it's important mm. that you give yourself let's say a month or two months in a disciplined way going in i don't know whatever you can manage you know people have jobs and stuff so if you're in a Monday to Friday, let's say you give yourself all day Saturday and maybe one or two evenings a week, you know, and you don't drink for a month or two. And that's your routine for, for a couple of months or something like that. I think you need to give yourself, it needs to be done in a time period. It needs to have a thread or a sound. And I think working with machines helps with that because um, you kind of get a sound going and you can evolve that from track to track, you know. So I think like the, for me, in terms of like writing writing an album, yeah, it's really a bit mindset, but I think you have to make a conscious decision to move away from how you're normally working. And mm. I think as an artist, creatively speaking, if you're not willing to do that, you're going to get stuck. You have to kind of go, I'm not going to be as productive for maybe a month and just sit here like grinding out sounds, you know, still writing, still write tracks. Like I, I write tracks as I create them. So I get the idea and I write it straight away so i could write a track in an hour or two it doesn't mean i'll release it but i have to get the idea out when you're in that moment and mm. this album has kind of come together like that and it all sounds very different to what my last albums have but that's the point you know and uh, i think creatively speaking it's a, it's a good challenge to set yourself you know and you know once you once you finish a project once you're happy with the mixes it can be tough to go back and forth and stuff i think you have to set a, a finish point and go, hey, look, send it to a couple of mates, see what they think, <laughs> test it in the car if you have one or if you can get into one. These kind of things, you know. Uh, I used to go over to one of my friends. He was also helping me with my radio show and uh, he was resident at all my parties as well. So, like, that was really the the test Anytime I had r- wrote a track. I used to go over to his house. This is about 10 years ago now, but we'd go over to his house and listen to it. He'd be like, no, or, yeah, kick drums rubbish or, you know, whatever like that, <laughs> you know, so... He's, he was a great DJ. Mark Lawless is his name. Yeah, I, th- I think you kind of need those kind of friends that will really give you an honest opinion on what, what it is and put, send it out to a couple of people people and, and see, see see what comes back. But definitely start the end point. You need to set that and, you know, see what's written in that time period and then kind of move on to the next thing. Yeah, how do you um how do you decide when how many tracks you should put in that album? I know that you said that 10 was a 10, but... Before that, for Embers, how did you decide what was your track limit? Because like, obviously with streaming platforms, you, you don't have to be that you know that hour mark anymore. It could be shorter, it could be longer. How was, what are your tips there? For me, like a safe number for an album is eight. For me, that feels like a safe number. I don't know if that's like a traditional um, approach to writing an album, but that seems like a safe number, you know? Um, I think the, the key really is not to have tracks in there for the sake of it. For example, when Matt suggested we do an album for my first album, I went back over everything and then you know the fact that i had that like opportunity you know i was like oh like i could stop now or i could keep going and tighten this up and i wrote more tracks that fit into that you know um so i think this tracks need to make sense and you need to be able to drop a track don't just add up the numbers or whatever or hey i've got 20 tracks i'll release 20 tracks because it's spotify i think like keep it tidy pick eight solid give or take well, pick a, a selection of tracks that really tell a story or, and have maybe some kind of flow flow to them, you know. And um, it's a tough question, but you, you that, the artist has to ask themselves that question. You have to actually make the decision. That's like an album or an EP is an artistic statement. So you need, this is you saying what this is, you know. So uh, if you're happy with it, you think it's there, you know, I'd, I'd always check it, you know, run it by a couple of people, DJs or something like that that you trust. And you know, see what comes back. People might love it, and you might be surprised at the feedback that comes back. And hey, that's done. Like a lot of artists will second guess themselves, you know. But mm. I think sometimes you might need a nudge to go. It's nearly there, but you know, maybe you need a, a bit more time at it, you know. Um, or maybe the mixes need a bit more time and stuff like that. So you've also got to be willing to hear that, you know, to get the best possible out- outcome. Uh, one of the questions in the chat says, is there a pressure to release 10 tracks that are all in the same genre? Get, yeah, very good question. I guess label managers might be able to answer that in terms of how Spotify performs and stuff like that. Mm. I think I wouldn't have a track with or an album with 10 different genres in it for each track. You know, <laughs> um, The album has to make sense. Now, some of the tracks could be ambient. Some of the tracks could be like techno-y 
kind of stuff, but they have to make sense as a thread. So if they mm-hmm. if it kind of blurs the lines between genres, I think a good album will do that anyway. But like be put might put it all into raw deep and or and hypnotic or, or whatever like that, you know. But I certainly would. What I do is just let it go. Just write. Just keep writing. And just don't go. Oh, I wouldn't play that or I wouldn't play that in a DJ set. Just keep writing. And once you get to a certain point, let's say you've been writing for two months and you've got twenty tracks, take stock. Go through it. Does this make sense as an album or do I just have a really, really, really good EP here? And in that Mm. case, do the EP and write something, write new stuff, you know. Um, It's really about the quality and stuff like that. And I think think that's very important. Having a vision for what you're doing with, with the record or with the release or with the EP, having a sound maybe in your head. What I found useful is visualizing that music in a space. So, for example, writing embers is visualizing it in Panorama Bar. I think that's also very helpful. I used to visualize stuff in like Time Warp or in Gas Head or in Amsterdam. That would kind of like set the tone where the kick drum is, the hi hat is, and that kind of thing. You know, I love that. That's cool. I guess you're selling that album to a label. Do you? Is does it need to be finished? Do you? Do you? Can you take kind of an idea to labels, or would you? You know, do, are you thinking it's got to be a fo- final product? The one you're happy with, is that a better option? I think at this day and age, you've got to finish it. It's got to be tight. It's It's got to be the finished product, I think. You know, um, that's I think that's really important. I think in this, you know, there was a time where you could go, maybe go back and forth. And maybe if you're friends with people in the label, you can say, hey, what do you think of this? If And that's the benefit of working with a label closely and saying, hey, what do you think of this? And they might go, hmm, I like track one and two maybe not track three and four, come back at something else. But in terms of like production and production quality, I think you need to be delivering like a finished mastered sounding track because that will maximize your chances of getting it signed to, that's the first thing. Second thing, is the idea finished if it's not mixed yet, you know? So I think you need to, going through the mixing process, you'll find these little snags, you'll find these things that maybe do and don't work. And if you don't get into the habit of mixing, like what we teach an elevator program is you start from the ground up and you learn it all and so that by learning all these different skills you become stronger as an artist it's like a language you're learning you know for me music production is a language and mm. i think you become more articulate the better you get at synthesis sound design mixing all these things you know so in terms of advice for producers i I'd definitely say you need to have the finished product you know maybe just go to a mate's house who has a bit more experience than you and ask for some advice and stuff like that that can help as well you know that's cool. Do you think do you think a new artist can release an album straight out of the bat, or do you think they need to build up with EPs and singles first? Um, a lot of labels will say now that the because everything's streaming and spot and Spotify focused, you're probably better off having an EP every month or two, maybe two three tracks, doing that for a year than having an album and then nothing for six months, just because your stuff is out there more. I think the main thing for an artist when they're starting off is one, don't jump into your first release too quickly. I think you need to get a real a body of work where you know you know okay this is where this is going sonically um your sound or your story needs to make sense musically so if you can you know get that right and you're confident in that and it might ca- t- might be a case that you've written really good tracks but you just need to go to a mix engineer for an afternoon or a couple of days just to get everything tightened up and go through that process and maybe start talking with a couple of labels to see if you can get in with them but i think maybe a few eps just to kind of make your mark and then look at doing an album at a later point you know and and, and certainly a lot of labels will recommend doing eps over an album straight off the bat someone asked in the chat where do you find all the time for these different projects producing mixing mastering teaching mentoring and working on the uh the elevator program yeah, that's a good question. To be honest, I I just work, I work extremely long hours. I work all the time and I've gotten fast at working. So the one thing I don't rush is uh, mixing other people's music. That's something I have to be very careful of because I take that very seriously, you know, and uh, someone's handing you their, their craft. So that's something I do like to take my time at. In terms of like high Brazil, like I write music fast, you know, because I like to capture the idea. Write it. I might not release it, but I've written it. Okay, cool. I can park it and maybe do another thing. The real key is like being organized and, and spending a lot of time at the coalface. And just, there's no substitute for it, it really is. And, and Graham, you can testify, you're doing the same thing. You're, you know, building up your know, data transmission in itself is a full-time job. So, um, you know, you've all these things on top, but I think that's a good example of what it, what it really takes, you know? Um, 
like when I was working as a promoter, I was doing music, working as a promoter, uh, teaching and stuff. So I just kind of got used to either working fast, working long hours and trying to squeeze as much time. But if you're if you're writing music, it's, it can be very hard to just walk into a room and go, OK, I've got two hours to write music. That's going to be tough, you know. Um, so you really need for writing and stuff, you need to give yourself a bit of headspace and, and kind of organize your time. So you have like, let's say, these times that aren't interrupted by email, social media, and like that you're going in you're giving yourself like eight hours to just be there write and record and stuff like that i think if sometimes it's it's actually a bit of a trap you can get sucked into the admin and and you know the the let's say more administrative side and organizational side if you're working all these all these multiple things but i think you have to organize your time and if need be something's got to give you know and if you got to give up alcohol or if you've got to give up socializing for a bit and just work on what you're doing you know that's what you have to do you know that's what any successful person will 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 say you know it's even you know it's it's ongoing work and even when you get to let's say oh my my goal was to get onto records you know and um mm-hmm. once it did i had to work harder again to write the next thing and write you know and you have to keep going and you have to keep exploring sounds and you have to keep uh, improving yourself you know so you have to like i think allocate time to certain things be organized and uh try to be efficient easier said than done sometimes but you've got to kind of take like a strategic approach sometimes but in terms of like the creative side you've got to give yourself headspace to do it you know um so that's why it's good to give yourself a routine where okay every saturday daytime i don't care what's happening that's like my day job i'm going in there you know i'm treating Mm. writing music like a day job so if someone says oh will you help me move apartment or do you want to go to a farmer's market or whatever you know you you, you (laughs) gotta just say no i'll see you at six o'clock i'm writing from nine to nine to six you know so people working full-time jobs it takes a lot out of you energy wise you know if you're trying to be creative that's a thing i'll come into contact with a lot working with artists um on elevator program but what i do say to them is you got to take your time and um allocate yourself time to be creative you know and that's sacred time nothing comes in I tell from my course, I tell people to. I use Google Calendar loads, and for me, from obviously, like you say, I'm running data transmission. I'm doing this. I'm doing my course. I'm helping some artists that I work with, and I literally block the time in my calendar and just literally put big chunks of time in for certain things. And that gives me that, like that, like you're saying, that creative space. My DT stuff is all done between 5 a.m. and 8 a.m. every morning. Well. Wow anything data transmission or nude is just literally blocked in from that time and anything that comes in during the day if i get 10 minutes and get to go through my emails then yes but if not it's back into the next morning and and once i started doing that it allowed my freedom so much like like because all i was always living in my emails all the time and just trying to and i just wasn't getting i wasn't achieving as much as i wanted to and i wasn't executing as much as i wanted to and but then once i kind of got into that headspace of like it's only happening in this time space it just frees up you so much you know I think, yeah, like, especially if you have, like, email on your phone, you're contactable all the time and stuff. And I, I, that's something, that's the reason why I moved away from doing events, because people would be just ringing you around the clock, you know. Oh, this thing's missing, or did we sell enough tickets for this, or, oh, can I have a gig, or, you know, it was like, it was relentless. I remember being in a car with a mate, we are travelling across Ireland, so when you get out of the city, like, Ireland's green, you know, so you've got green fields everywhere, and, like, sheep and cows and everything so i love driving around ireland and you can drive around ireland like in, you know a few hours if you want it's not a big country but it's beautiful you know and that's one of my favorite things to be in a car either listening to music or just listening to nothing just being in a car but i was in a, I was in a car with a friend and my phone just kept going and like someone rang me like completely out of the blue you know wanting me to do something and someone else rang me something else they wanted something else and thing I was like three, four calls came in and, and my mate was like, just turn off your phone, man. Like, just turn it off and deal with it when you need to deal with it, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, do you need to take all these calls and stuff? And are you focusing enough on, let's say, your short term goals, which are maybe, OK, getting selling tickets for this gig or getting my next EP done or do a social media? You know, that's part of everyone's short term goals, keeping the social media going, these kind of things. You know? And social media is another one, you know, if it can just swallow you up. You can go into a post and then an hour later, you're just browsing through and going, oh, I don't agree with that. Or, oh, that's cool. And and you get sucked into the whole thing. And I think uh, you've got to be very careful with that. I delete social media apps off my phone. Mm-hmm. And if I need to use them, I install it, go in, do a post and delete it again. And 
you know, or else use a desktop app, app or des something on desktop like business for Facebook uh, to do posts, you know, so because it keeps me off the timeline and I just get sucked into it. And then before you know, it, I'm reading something I really don't care about, but I was given this like five, 10 minutes of my time. But that's the genius of these algorithms. You know, it's designed to capture your attention. I think if you want if you want to be really productive and, and um, I think creative and stuff, you got to manage people's access to you. You got to manage simple things like turning off notifications for social media, email and messages, you know, and WhatsApp. That, that in itself will free up so much space. These pings kind of, you know, you get your dopamine hit, then you go check it, <laughs> then you go check another message. And it's like, oh, you're in a group and someone said a funny thing, and, you know, and it's like you've got to really limit your distractions and stuff. And like you said, like you're doing the 5 a.m. club thing, you get up at five, you do five to eight is data transmission uh, and then on to your next thing, you know. It's so good because it's so nobody messages you at five, at four at four forty five a.m. No one, there's no one messaging you, and it's just like I can just focus on getting that chunk of data transmission done in that space, and then it's like, and then I'm happy, it's done, it's done, you know. It's just like I can move, I can, yeah. I've got the whole day to focus on, you know, sorting out interviews and whatever else, and Twitch streams and everything else that's part of my life these days, you know. Uh, I completely yeah. agree with the, the notifications thing. It's just like my my like literally my phone has buzzed about 50, 50 times since we've been speaking. It's just and I'm like, <laughs> oh my god, what's going on? Like you know. Yeah. Um, one thing I was going to ask you about at the album process before we move on: Do you yeah. release singles and EPs during that process, or do you just go into like I'm full on album? I'm just going to record this. Nothing else matters. How's that process for you? Uh, that's again an interesting question. I guess I guess when I started working with records, like I had releases with like Break New Soil, and so you know, a big thanks to Gregor Thresher for putting that was my first release after actually I moved to Berlin on a Berlin label. So big thanks to Gregor for his support on that. So I was like releasing tons of stuff, EPs, nearly every two months, you know, um, mm. but nonstop was just pumping stuff out there. And then I kind of, once I started working with Matt and, and Records, I kind of just took a step back. And my friend Eva as well, she 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 was like, slow it down. You know, when I first started going over to Matt's, you know, I'd be in their house and we'd be having, you know, lunch or whatever. And Eva's like, just slow down with the with the releases and stuff. So I kind of stopped releasing as regular and that kind of gave me headspace to think as to what to do next, you know? And mm. so as I was writing Embers, Embers came out and Embers was released in November and I didn't actually do anything between, let's say, Afro EP and Embers. I just left that space there. And then following on from there, I've actually had more space between releases than I usually would have. And this year I'm going to change that a bit. I've done a release that, you know, I did my album in January. Um, we did Osmo Same Wave debut EP in, in March did two of the done in uh, which is my most recent ep on 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 records yeah working on the album thing now but in the over the course of that writing the album there was some overlap but those are days kind of like where i wasn't really in the same mindset if that makes sense mm. these just felt like tracky tracks and there's also tracks i'd written maybe later in last year that i'd kind of revisited and remixed and and stuff like that so um, I kind of I moved studio in, in November, so I actually had to. It took took me some time to settle and recalibrate into that space as well, you know. Uh, but it's a good question. But like, it, you kind of need to know yourself, you know. You could write twenty tracks and go, okay, well these eight are really good. I th I think this makes sense as an album. And you know, these two over here are too good not to release. I'm gonna release that as an EP on my own label or with friends or on a label I work with and and stuff like that. So. It really depends if you feel something solid and strong as a unit, either as an EP or as an album, then that really has to come from you, you know, and you have to make that decision. That's cool. That makes loads of sense. Uh, I've got an artist I'm working with at the moment. He's got like 40 tracks ready and I'm like, we're just trying to work out what to do with them. So this has been really, really helpful. Yeah. He could do two tracks a month for, you know, get through a lot of it, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, set up his own, own thing and, and set up his own label or project and make sure there's a tight artwork or design aesthetic there, kind of build up his profile and do the PR thing and make sure he's doing the social media stuff to support it. One thing I made sure to do with the Elevator program is to establish a label. So if someone has something good and they want to release it, you release it. That's important because it's very tricky. You know, if you don't know a label or if you don't know someone who runs a label, or maybe you do, but it's not your sound. What do you do? You know, who do you talk to, or, or stuff like that. So that's why we've kind of we've established the label side to uh, elevator program as well. 
Let's talk about the elevator. Let's talk about let's talk about that in uh, full. Tell us about the the whole breadth of elevator. They're saying they'd love to hear about the elevator program and what's covered. Yeah. So elevator program. What what is it? The crux of it is we teach people how to make music, like how to write records. You know. So mm -hmm. that goes from grounds up, bricks and mortar, brick by brick. You know, foundations up to finishing the track. So the course is totally focused on writing tracks and finishing them. The learning program itself, let's say the, the lessons and how it's structured is has come as a result of working with artists in one-to-one -one settings over, let's say, 10 years. And some of them were beginner, some of them were advanced, some of them were making music for five years but not finishing tracks. The main thing you come across as an engineer or producer is someone can't finish, they have good ideas but can't finish the record. So what I did is de develop like the system for I could guide people through. Look, this is drum programming. You need to learn drum programming inside out. This is how you you know get some nice bass sounds. You know, using operator synth or whatever in, in Ableton. This is how you get your hi hat sounding a certain way. This is how you use the sampler. Let's say you get a sample pack with some stuff in it, and you like one little hit or whatever. Chop it up, dice it, create your own instrument in Ableton and sampler instrument and and use that in your, in your track. So we teach people synthesis and, and the, the real building block stuff. I built it as something I would hand to my younger self starting out. So nice. what we do is we teach, we teach people just the art and craft of making music. We have a label there for people who go through the whole process. We have a free masterclass, which you can kind of get a brief idea of how I work. If you want to actually see how I work, check that masterclass out. Because that's it in a mm -hmm. nutshell. That's very much how my album is done. It's just, you know, throw, throw in a couple of loops, get the sound right, get the balance right, get some MIDI out to some machines, hit record, you know, automate by hand and, uh, you know, see what results come with it. Uh, but really, it's it's about teaching people the art and craft of making music and finishing music. And so that comes from your basic stuff like drum programming, working with synths, or getting the best out of, let's say, Ableton's in-the-box power, you know, so all working in the box, EQs, compression, all that stuff and funny enough as i was writing embers my first album for records i was also building our main product which is our main course which is the artist development program which is a six month program so what i did is i took on like 10 students and over six months i worked with them and they made their way through the program but i do calls with them every month to see how they're getting on how they're finding it and that stuff and i tweaked the content based on that feedback working with that test group and that to me is like the equivalent of doing a master's in music production. If I was to submit a thesis on music production, that would be it. Uh, nice. The artist development program. So that's delivered, drip fed over six months. And it's hardcore, you know. We do, like, I pick a topic every week. What I do is kick drum production grant. I kind of was able to talk about that myself. The next week, you know, I'll go in, I check, I pick a topic and check every youtube video i could and make sure i didn't miss anything and that's literally how i built every topic so even myself building the artist development program was hugely beneficial to me creatively because i felt yeah. like i was going back to school a bit if you want to learn something teach it because you have to be able to explain if you really understand something you should be able to explain it to someone who doesn't know that topic so mm -hmm. basically filling in the gaps for myself synthesis all these things building that program is really laid the foundation block of what the high brazil sound is now and that is in technique. So if someone doing it, um, for example, the first EP we signed from uh, one of our students is from a guy from Cork, and he's making really cool house music, kind of Ch Kerry Chandler style, nice vibes, Sick. and really good, you know? Uh, so the techniques are there. You can put it into whatever you want, you know? Uh, if you're making techno, it's handy because obviously I'm making techno, so my sound <laughs> goes that direction anyway. Yeah. But it's all about technique and learning music is a language. It's like a craft. It's like studying carpentry or that is the skills, you know, that is the science the behind it. The art is what you make with that, you know, so you can have 10 people who've studied carpentry, but you'll have one who's being incredibly original and you might have, you know, let's say another person who's kind of doing what Ikea is doing, you know. So really you have to learn the craft and the skills, apply those skills and put that you know put that into action but it re really i think learning the technicalities and learning the technology on a deeper level will help you like get better results creatively speaking so the whole program is centered around showing people how to make tracks because even myself finishing sound and music tech you know you have this amazing time with all your all these people and some some of the people i studied music tech with in dublin i'm still friends with 
and really good friends with you know and it was it was an incredible experience that way but afterwards it just felt like nobody knew what to do next you know it's like oh i hadn't thought about this or you know there was no like hey you can get a job here or maybe you know upskill and get a certification and you can maybe get a job in in radio or or whatever that you know i just felt there was a lot lacking in putting people on a path where they can apply what they've learned either some people just want to make tunes and play tracks and dj and that's it you know you want that's kind of a lot of the people who we help some people want to learn you know advanced synthesis some people want to get a job in a radio station and be at sound tech for that person i recommend going to a, you know maybe a certified college that has a history of getting people into those jobs you know but what i found with like a lot of artists that came to me was they could have been at it maybe some of them eight years you know but they just didn't get that last 20 30 percent which was pulling the idea together getting a track out of it mixing it saying it's done and moving on to the next one you know so that's where we put a, a creative process in place where we're, we start with the rhythm section get the bass in get the synths in and stuff and it's not template based you don't say hey do this and do that it's flow and process and we're trying to get people to just finish more music get more productive that's the whole aim of the game and that's why we have a label there as well so people have that space where their music is safe they're you know again lots lots of happens to lots of people i know happened to me as well where you release tracks on a label you don't really know and and all of a sudden your tracks are registered for publishing without your knowledge you know and that happens quite a lot uh, so this is just a, a, a space where the artists own their music you know we put it out there and see the label is in the early stages obviously so it's we're kind of getting artists coming through or who are let's say pushing their sound and I'm, I'm quite fussy about what i sign anyway so i'm kind of like hey maybe work on that or change you know so um there'd be an element of that but that kind of offers the after support where someone could submit a track for the label and i'll say hey i like this i think this is on the right path let's kind of work on develop that idea into maybe three or four tracks you know I like the fact you've added a label as well. I did that with my course as well. It's it's it definitely helps. Like you know, you, you when they go through it, and you're just like, yes, I can. I'm, I, I like you, and I'm like, I like what your music. I like, the, and you just it just keeps that flow going, doesn't it? Like in your case, you're working with a lot of artists who are, you know, need help with, you know, everything, their whole careers and stuff like that. It's a great idea because then you can kind of pick people who are fitting into, you know, let's say musically or whatever the case may be, fitting into what you're doing, and there's a platform there for them. I think that's. That, that's very important you know cool and then let's talk about the studio from a mastering mixing point of view uh i know that's yeah. key on your let's just chat through that okay yeah so uh studio is hps studios it's a new project so it's still let's say in development you know so matt and i have worked uh, radio slave and i've worked together for a couple of years now i've been doing mixing for other artists on records not every artist obviously but if someone needs help you know they might asked me hey can you mix this for for me or whatever so i did some stuff for i'm uh, doing an ep for raven at the moment i did an ep for tio nasa uh love his music great guy he's he's amazing um you know i had been doing like mixing i had you know very mixed credits on like some serve records and some radio slave records and stuff uh, matt suggested me look get yourself organized and and maybe you know start organizing yourself as a, let's say a, a mixing project you know that's where it kind of started. I was like, okay, HPL, da, 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 you know, and then then we kind of evolved the idea into, hey, let's do some sample packs and let's kind of let's just write create packs that we'd use in our in our productions or in our let's say creative process. So, like a lot of the album, a lot of my new album, the, all the drums are from my ninety nine sample packs because I record <laughs> my I don't know if you can see it, record it, then I do all the processing I would do post in in let's say post production or mixing on each of the elements rendered them back out so if i want a kick drum that sounds like near ready to go i just pop one of them in and that was really helpful i was able to put in loops and stuff like that so we've kind of got this shared space in riverside studios in berlin yeah matt's incredibly prolific he's in here writing tracks all, all the time i'm writing tracks we actually collaborated on a remix pack for my album embers which will be coming out in records in 2022 and yeah they were kind of in the process of building up the sample packs side of things we have some packs up matt's got some really cool uh, loop packs up there on the site already and yeah i've got like my 99 samples and i've got some uh, mono synth stuff that i created so you could build your own sampler instrument from stuff i put in there you know so this all kind of very much ties in with i guess ties in with high brazil ties in with elevator program where we're you know teaching people how to 
make music we've just added mentorship that's a new thing as public it was like for let's say a smaller group but and now i'm kind of opening that up to other people so i'm doing monthly skype coaching calls or, or zoom calls or whatever and the sample packs just seem seem like a natural progression and we're kind of working on those at the moment so i've got some stuff up in the site and yeah we've kind of pooled all our resources here so we moved in with kind of every penny i had i just piled into getting a new studio computer got some adam a8x speakers which i wanted for years some of the bits i already had like the 909 and stuff uh this is a lot of math stuff here the nord lead and and juno and stuff so kind of pile pool resources and yeah it's it's worked really well you know so like any project it takes time to develop but like our vision is to really have it's like a a toolkit for underground producers where you get kick, solid kicks and hi-hats and and bass sounds and stuff like that stuff you can throw into samplers and stuff so it's kind of like an underground platform you know uh so technical services so i do obviously mixing for other artists i work with obviously a couple of records people and work with some artists in detroit as well and you know i love, I love mixing tracks so it's we're kind of it kind of put everything and organized what i was doing anyway into like a project as soon as it's a project i kind of go into this and i'm sure you do as well graham i've gone to this kind of hyper mode it's like oh, i have to get the site ready and i need to get this ready and stuff so <laughs> but HB, hbl is still a work in progress but yeah it's something we're developing and stuff but like really the long-term goal is that like elevator where i was I'm building courses that i would hand to my younger self what we want to do at hbl studios with sample packs is build sample packs that we would use ourselves that's the kind of plan you know and fle flesh that out in terms of different directions different sounds but i'm quite into sampling machines and like working on kick drums and different decays of kick drums and stuff like that not everyone's going to be into that as a sample pack some people want the finished kind of deal and you're throwing some loops mm -hmm. and put it into ableton and off you go so i'm kind of like merging the more let's say hey there's a kick drum that's you know four of them sound very similar but in actual fact the decay is slightly different on each one you know it's quite nerdy stuff but I, i'm sure there's people out there that, that want that kind of control as well you know so i'm trying to balance balance that at the moment but what i like about it is it forces me to sit with machines let's say for i'm making a sample pack of a 101 or whatever but so the the uh, my mono synth collection is from my sh09 which is the older brother of the 101 synth but I literally sat with the machine, just pressing notes and just moving sliders and stuff and really feel like you get to know the machine. So that in itself feeds into my creative process, you know, and like recording the 909, that was like painstaking stuff. There's something like 180 versions of the kick drum, you know, um, <laughs> it's all, you know, like this, like it's, it's insane amount of kick drums, but Again, I, feel, I felt like I knew it, but then when I need a kick drum quickly or need need something to put into a, a track, that stuff was there and I kind of actually, you know, save myself some time down the road. So a lot of these things are cyclical and I try to try to make them work work like that, you know. And someone's on the topic of time management earlier. There's an example of one project <laughs> helping the next into the next, you know. Some people might like the High Brazil thing, go, oh, he's got a free masterclass on elevator program which is like 30 minutes it's me writing a track from scratch here uh on some synths and ableton 11 and people go oh cool i've got to check that out and you know sign up and you know see if i see if i learn something you know so these things are all cyclical but i try to try to make everything work and gel you know do you know i was just about to say exactly the same thing about the time management thing I, the more i listen to you the more i was thinking you, you you work very similar to how i work projects feed into each other and therefore the time management thing becomes they're just all helping each other and something in one project helps the next project so then it becomes that it opens up these other projects that looks like you're doing loads and it looks like you're you must have no time in the world but it's actually not because your things are copying across to other things and it's just it actually helps each other you know and that's how the time management thing works out for you yeah yeah i had a, a very good teacher a history teacher in school i used to love history and i think it's actually because of this guy because i had no interest in it and mm. when i was 15 he's like right put down your books i'm going to tell you how to write an exam and i'm like that's a very strange approach you're going to tell us how to do an exam uh, you know you're not going to tell us the content and he's like all about time management so if you've got 100 marks and you've got five topics let's give yourself i don't know you've got two and a half hours so you've got 30 minutes per topic break that down <laughs> into four parts so you've got you know seven and a half minutes per part and that's it don't give yourself any more time than that before you start anything give yourself 10 minutes and do a, a brain map of your answers 
so I did, I used to do this in all my exams and people used to be like, what is this lad doing? He's like, I did a brain, like a map of what I was going to say on the first page of that question. And then I'd write it out and I would stick to it religiously and have this structure because they say the first 50% of an exam is the easiest 50% to get. So you got to do the first 50% of each part, you know? So I think like multitasking is much the same and uh, making music is much the same. You know, you got to give yourself time to do all the different things if you just enjoy the bit where you go in you're just smashing out recordings and you don't really like the mixing and mastering bit if there's something resistant there that's probably the thing you need to work on the most so mm. you need to kind of force yourself to do that thing you don't enjoy <laughs> after a while it will be just become normal but people have these kind of mental blocks that they need to break through everyone has it i've had it it's really about breaking through those barriers and being as productive as you possibly can. I always have the other one. I know how long certain things take me. And I know that if I look at my watch and I've got seven minutes till I have to do something, I always ask myself, what? Right, look at my list. Which one of these can I do? I know I can do in seven minutes. Right, I'm going to do that. And instead of just going, instead of just sitting there for seven minutes, wait, I'll just smash out something else in that seven minutes and really use it, you know? Yeah, but sometimes, you know, if you have that seven minutes before you have to go get a train, it's amazing what you can get done in that seven minutes, like respond to five <laughs> emails. So uh, before I ask you your five things producers need to know, I'm just going to give some shout outs to the people in the chat. Rio Sik? Oh, Riosk. Yeah, that's that's Sven, yeah. actually, one of, my, one of my star students. Tell me about him. Uh, Sven's a uh, Dublin DJ. Again, Sven's a great example of, uh, like, the people we like working with. Sven is he's Dublin DJ, he knows his records, you know, inside out. You know, it's a good record collection. Not everyone gets into making music early in, or, you know, in their 20s or early 20s or whatever. Some people take till their late 20s or whatever the case may be to get into it. But Sven made the decision, look, I want to get into this. And he just jumped in head first, like every lesson, every class, every mentorship call, 110%. Like it's exactly how you should approach music production. And uh, I guess the, the most liberating thing you can do when you're starting with music production is to acknowledge, look, you might be DJing a few years, you might have some experience or whatever like that, but when you're in the studio doing this on your own, this takes time and you got to give yourself time to learn the craft. Yeah, Spencer Riosk is a good example of that and he's making really cool stuff at the moment, so we're hoping I'm pushing him to get an EP together for the Elevator label. That's who we like work with. People are just really into the process and stuff like that. And that's like a great example. And also an example of like what it takes to progress, just consistent effort, being like present, trying your best all the time and just having a passion for what you're doing and, and putting that in and, and finding your sound and stuff as an artist is, is one of the hardest things. That's why we say we teach the art and science, you know, we teach you the techniques use the techniques to find your way, find your sound. And that comes from repetition, practice, going through the process, finishing your tracks. You know, if you stop at the 60% mark every time, you're only ever going to get to 60%. You've got to finish it and see it through. And that last 40% might take you a long time now, but in time, it all gets quicker and it gels into the creative process, you know? So you'd be mixing as you're writing music. That's kind of how we teach. You know, start mixing straight away, get your EQ in you know, uh, balance, you know, work from the ground up. That's the elevator philosophy. One of the questions in the chat is, do you have a method to switching from creative mindset to logical for mixing and mastering? That's a very good question. Yeah, it's, it, technically it's two sides of the brain. So what I do is when I'm writing, I go in and like I said earlier, I get some ideas up on the board. I'll get some media to some machines. I'll hit play and see what's coming back. You know, sometimes, especially older machines, you send MIDI notes to them and you're like, what the hell is that? Like we have a uh, Jupiter 6 there and you send stuff to it. And like, where the hell did that come from? And you just go with it and write write the song. I, I, if you if you check out that masterclass, um, I think one of your colleagues shared it there earlier on, that's exactly what I do, you know? So I go into that space then and I just write and record and I kind of do a flow of that, spend a bit of time just recording. Then after time, I'll take a stop, take a step back and then maybe mix a couple of tracks in it over a couple of days. What I, like, I don't like to let, leave things on, like let tracks pile up for weeks and months on end. I like to stop and mix them and see, right, what from this can I release? And um, what is just maybe, maybe I'll just take some elements and put them into a new track or something like that. You know, it might not necessarily be something you definitely release. Yeah, I think, I think it's two def different mindsets. I do split that process. Now I mix as I go. You know, I balance the elements as I go. I 
try get a balance and everything i don't like have everything up in the reds i have everything balanced as i go so the, i mix as i work and then mm-hmm. when i go into the mixing stage i, I kind of start over again and I mix it again you know so i might render everything out stems bring it into a logic session logic project and work from start you know start with the balance obviously make some tweaks and stuff like that and um, lots of analog emulation obviously i'm really into that and uh yeah you got through i got through this mixing into mastering process you know so two different mindsets so it's a very good question but yeah that's definitely an approach but i do try to mix as i go and then when you go to the mixing stage the mix is stronger again you know and i think that's a big part of my sound if you listen to tracks like we don't flip which i think is like six elements maybe seven um a kick the bass is the lead there's a vocal high hat maybe two hi-hats, a right cymbal, uh, maybe some ambient stuff, like six, seven elements, and that's it. But the sound, the production, you know, it's all, that's all in there, you know. So I think you need to, uh, for a truly great sound, I think you should mix as you work and then mix again on top. Whether that be rendering out stems and starting a new project just for mixing or, you know, giving yourself that headroom and the CPU. What I find if you render out tracks from your uh, session, you kind of start fresh and you're not looking at the CPU meter going up, which will put you off using plugins or whatever that you kind of, I'd like to print it, print the mix or print the track and then work on the mix as a separate project and then render that out and work on the master as a separate project. Interesting. Uh, they said, thanks for that detailed answer. Welcome skeleton keys. Thanks for joining us. Uh, any, any tips for drum bus processing? Oh yeah. Good question as well. I used to, do quite a lot of bus processing in the creative section i don't really you know so for me it's like mixing is really about the individual parts and making everything sound full and solid so i don't leave too much to the bus process you know i might have like maybe an ssl bus compressor doing a slight bit of compression you know i produce the tracks as singular elements make sure they all sound right i'll bring it maybe into the mixing my mixing project do the same again. I'll have some buses, like a low-end bus, a drum bus, synth bus, uh, maybe an effects bus or vocal bus. And that's really to be similar produ- production across all of them, you know, except obviously tweaking EQ and quite subtle. So what I like to do in that respect, in terms of drum bus compression, maybe a small bit of saturation can be nice. Maybe a small bit of EQ, brighten up the hats. Maybe subtractive EQ before you do anything, taking out any any rogue frequencies, but it's better to do that on the individual element. If you have a problem in your hi-hat, EQ the hi-hat, don't EQ the group, you know? Work with a kind of, maybe use some light saturation, maybe some like analog emulation, like an analog channel strip, uh, maybe a bit of EQ, like post-production EQ to kind of gel it all together. I might put everything into a mix bus and put some light, like, compre- you know, maybe, not, I don't use any compression really in my mixing anymore. I used to use a lot. You know, it needs to be like compression, compression, compression. Um, if you go back to like 2012, 2013. But now it's more about really balance and it's about like um, really balance and placement. We have a mixing course as well, but it really, what's well, about is balance and placement. So if you put a lot of things in your track that are clashing frequency wise, that's going to be a tough mix no matter who the mix engineer is. But if you have, a, if everything has its place, um, kick, bass, synth, you know, and that can be from synth octave range, um, making sure synths either talk off each other or are, you know, separated by pitch enough that they they both can be heard. Placement and all these things are very important, you know. So the actual bus compression and that kind of thing, I don't really rely on anymore. There's a drum bus plugin in Ableton. I just recommend people don't use it. I think it kills dynamics completely, you know. It sounds like it's doing something good, but I think it actually kills your dynamics and then that will affect your mastering the key for me is subtle 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 maybe compression if you're going to use it but subtle saturation maybe a bit of eq maybe some analog emulation that kind of thing and i'm going to work off num- of all the groups that same way you know what well, i've got loads of questions now for they're all flowing in now what dv level do you render your pre-masters at minus six or something else yeah minus six and you know, I try to put my kick drum in at minus seven or eight because I know I'll just go above that. If I set it at minus six, everything else will go to minus four. Uh, so yeah, minus six is a good one. That's what most mastery engineers want to want to see. Any plugins you couldn't live without? Fab filter EQ. I think everyone uses that. I think that's fantastic. 
SSL G channel. I'm actually just looking at a project I've opened here. The SSL. I love Wave stuff because they do lots of like analog emulation, so I've, like tons of Wave plugins, and they're all paid for by the way. So that would be one of my tips: make sure you buy your plugins, you know, support the industry that way. But yeah, I like the SSL mm -hmm. emulators on Waves. I think they're really cool. H delay on Waves is really cool. The VEQ4, I think that's what it's called. Let me check the name here. There's a Puig Child 670 compressor, which I'm loving at the moment as well. Also from Waves. VEQ4, yeah, it's an EQ I really like from Waves as well. It's modeled on a uh, Neve console. So that kind of stuff, yeah, I, re I really like. Uh, the NLS channel strip as well. That's another one I really like from Waves. So I use a lot of Waves plugins when I'm mixing, you know. So it kind of snowball, I buy one or two, and then they go, oh, Buy one more and you get another two free and I'm like, okay, I'll buy another one and then so now I've lots of ways plugins. But um yeah, I think like the J thirty seven tape uh emulator is really good as well. Uh Kramer tape's pretty cool, you know. Yeah, but Fab Filter I think is is definitely the best EQ I've ever worked with. And I think EQ, surgical EQ is very important before you add any distortions or any of that kind of thing. You have to clean up your elements before you do it. Actually a couple of things in people using Ableton, like in the box stuff like saturator in Ableton is amazing. So when I'm working writing in the writing stage, I'm mainly using Ableton in the box plugin. So EQ to scoop at any frequencies I don't want. Maybe the you know the saturator plugin, I'm always using that. The reverb I really like in there as well. You know, so obviously because I've taught people on this, I kind of got to know the technicalities of how it works. I just I find them super effective and I really like using them. So you know don't get caught in the plugin trap, you know, getting the latest stuff just Pick a few, work with them, and it's really about working on your sound, getting your sound tight. I'm going to jump in your Discord as well. I love Discord, by the way. I, I saw you jumped in ours, so I'm definitely going to jump in yours. It's one of my favorite places. Yeah, I was, I was kind of, we have nearly 3,500 people on the platform, but I've, I've been saying to people, like, we've got all these artists here, but, you know, they're all independent of each other, you know? And uh, I was like, how, how can we get this? You know, I put a forum there for a while, which worked a bit. People were going to ask questions, I'd go answer them. And stuff but i signed up to richie's discord richie hotton's discord and i was like okay this is perfect like people can chat amongst themselves direct message each other it's on an app it's easy to access perfect you know so um yeah i literally just started it on on friday as in built the let's say infrastructure so we're going to roll it out but yeah of course uh join in and let me know if you have any tips or pointers i was always open to feedback I'm learning mine as well. We're kind of it's been yeah, it's been a learning process for sure, uh, which has been good fun. Our, ours has been dropped in the chat as well. Wicked, thank you so much for joining us. I thank you all that everyone that's been watching it. I th thanks so much. It's been so much. It's been really interesting to chat to you. Go and join his elevator program if you if those in the chat. It does sound amazing. And thank you so much, Will, for joining us. Oh, thanks, Graham. It's been great. Thanks very much. <laughs> Did you enjoy that? What did you get out of it? Let me know in the comment below. I'd love to know. What was your favorite thing? What's your biggest takeaway? Again, let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to come and join us on Twitch, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, 1 p.m. till 5 p.m. And I'll see you in the next video. See you soon, bye-bye.